I've been tracking something for many, many years that I'm, I'm putting a name to today called Cloud Graphics and Digital Overlays. And we're fortunate enough, I've, I, I've been scrambling to get uh, uh, various vendors in this space to contribute content to this. So in this presentation, you're going to see content from 15 different vendors that are in this space, Cloud Graphics. How many people, show of hands, think they know what Cloud Graphics is all about? And how many then are here to learn and figure out what's going on here? Cool. All right. So, and then we'll have a demo in the middle. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through what this is. I'm going to talk about some research that will hopefully um, explain why it's important. And then we will talk about key use cases. And then we'll run through the vendor. So if you're, how many people here are running OTT services or live streaming services? And you're interested in inter increasing the production value of such? So graphics is, um, I think in one of my posts I said essentially, Video and TV, basically TV is three molecules, if you think about it. It's video, it's audio, and then it's graphics. The graphics is kind of a nerdy word, but the truth is it's at the core of our business. If you go to IBC or NAB and you've been doing so for 10 or 15 years, you'll notice like those vendors that sell those graphics machines are uh, basically driving a great majority of the, uh, not a majority, but a large portion of the market that we talk about here. And so something that's disruptive, i.e. cloud graphics, or even um, one step higher, the desktop graphics, which are more affordable and more easy to use than, than traditional broadcast graphics, um, those are the kinds of things that have a disruptive uh, impact on, on the business. So um, again, Brian Ring, for those of you who just walked in, come join us. 20 years in video and TV uh, and OTT tech, I've kind of been in every domain here from the business side, covering everything from advertising to direct to consumer streaming to pay TV legacy, all the way down to the deep technical stuff, working with some of the encoding vendors to describe how they do, for example, per title encoding, which uh, Jan just talked about in the last session. If you want to access this uh, presentation that you're about to see, it's all available at this domain, ringdigital.tv slash future of TV. There are also 18 other free reports there. They um, contain consumer surveys on changing TV behaviors, which I've been covering for pa the past five years. So you'll see stuff there on social TV, on interactivity, et cetera. I would highly encourage you to uh, follow me on Twitter and uh, most importantly, sign up for that. Um, it's basically a quarterly free uh, uh, research letter. So this is, I think, probably a little bit difficult to read so I'll kind of walk over here and help. This is just a very high level simplification. We talk about graphics, what are we talking about? There's four kind of key things that I broke it up in my head as to what graphics uh, systems need to do. You need to have a creative person come and author a graphics package of some sort for some portion of the live video production. You need to activate those graphics, typically in real time with data, for example, or uh, social media content. You need to then render that out into video. And this is where that heavy iron machinery is really important to render um, really high-end, high-performance graphics is still uh, the domain, I would say, of these traditional broadcast graphics vendors, the VizRT, Avid, Ross, Chiron being a few of the main vendors in that space. Uh, and then the output, I would say, is just mostly on, on the broadcast graphics side. You're basically tied to a streaming video chain anyways. Then you have the kind of advent of desktop graphics. You're, you're talking about here programs like Wirecast, vMix, and XSplit that have plugins, essentially, that you can buy a package um, of plugins for those uh, tools, and you will essentially give yourself the capability of creating broadcast uh, professional-looking graphics. And then you have this third tier, which is what we're calling here cloud graphics or HTML5 graphics, which we're going to dive into more fully. And like many things uh, in terms of the cloud video and the cloud video value proposition, it starts with being on demand, easy to use, low cost, open source, et cetera. And then it slowly sort of moves up the stack. Now, I think what's interesting in this space today, and you'll see as I go through the main trends, is that there is a reason that today most broadcasters don't use cloud graphics, i.e. they have already paid and invested in their infrastructure and talent, et cetera. And there is no reason not to use such great quality equipment. But in the streaming era, we have all kinds of new content, all kinds of new content players inventing new genres. And therefore, that's created a little bit of space 
for, um, for this new emerging category, which I would like to uh, have us all talk about as a new category of emerging technology. So just a quick review of what I've just said. So here's your broadcast graphics systems. This is an example of, a, of systems that are so expensive that you essentially need to, um, if you're a low cost production or whatever, you might need to rent one of these, uh, you know, it's, it's not a pizza box, it's like a four, looks like a four rack unit system that carries the ability to uh, execute on Ross Expression, Chiron Higo, VizRT. Then you have this desktop world or universe, the vMix, the Wirecast, in which you can, I think there's um, a company that I, I uh, denote here as Blue Title FX, for example, that can be integrated into a Wirecast system and give you full uh, broadcast-like graphics at $3,000. So it's a lower price point and it's a great product. And again, if you have somebody on site conducting uh, essentially producing the stream, or you have enough manpower and creativity to do that, these are great solutions. Um, and then you have this other uh, item that we're calling here cloud graphics. Now, the technical element of this is as, as follows. So what are cloud graphics? Cloud graphics are basically graphics that are using HTML to render dynamic things on a screen in a browser and then writing those frames to video. And so Cr Chromium Embedded Framework, if you go to the Wikipedia page, you will see literally hundreds of world-class manufacturers of software, Adobe uh, on down, that have used the Chromium Embedded Framework in some way. You can think of this as a headless Chromium. Right, so it's another way, I don't know if that, hopefully that makes sense to some of the geeks in the room, but you, you have a, something that acts like a Chromium browser, but invisibly inside of another product. And so once that was, uh, came onto the market, uh, many players over the years that are experienced in, in, in graphics have used at one time or another a laptop with a browser, with an SDI out or an HDMI out into their workflows. So this is quite a simple and easy thing to do to integrate broadcast, um, uh, high quality graphics into your production. And then I have a little kind of call out here to the BBC. They, at 2018, 2018 October, at this G Streamer con uh, conference, how many are familiar with G Streamer? Just trying to get a sense of it. So it's an, it's an open source tool that's widely deployed. And I think I'm just using BBC as the sort of name, uh, basically, you know, obviously world-class broadcaster, a lot of innovation that happens at the BBC. And so those guys actually assign eight people you can go to GitHub and download this tool, and it's quite amazing. And it's the first instance that I've seen where um, any, anybody's put anything out in an open source context that takes Chromium embedded framework and specifically references it in this kind of cloud audio video mixing universe. It's a little bit of a validator. So if this has been around for so long and these waves of tech do come and go, why did I decide now was the time? Uh, number one, and I wouldn't say these are really in order, but in some sense they probably are. You're all aware of Twitch. There's a Twitch economy that's growing and exploding. It's changing the way that people interact, uh, what kinds of content they, in, they um, watch and also how they interact with that content. Chat and um, emojis and tips are a real part of this environment, so it's a real conversational kind of environment. And that ecosystem has spawned companies, both of which are listed in, in my ecosystem slide that you'll see in a bit, a bit. One of them was called Streamlabs. Streamlabs was just acquired by Logitech for $90 million. Another one's called Stream Elements. And essentially, what both of these companies have done is said, hey, we can create a lot of really interesting graphics and text and interactivity on the screen by simply creating these overlays in HTML and bringing them into the OBS software. OBS software is open broadcast software. Uh, people hopefully are familiar with it. How many are familiar with OBS? Because this is kind of key, right? So I talked about Wirecast and VMAX. This is the open source tool uh, of, of such uh, a type of software. And essentially, Twitch, along with Logitech and NVIDIA, amongst other companies, have just poured a lot of money into this ecosystem. So you have these startups that are basically, um, uh, like I say, stream elements, which we'll talk about later, creating these overlays, and they're sort of embedded into the Twitch platform, right? So if you're a Twitch streamer and you want people in your chat, you want to take those chat messages and put them into your screen, that ecosystem is really, has had a lot of money poured into it. So that's really important. Second, um, in general, not just Twitch, but live streaming in the influencer economy is another big driver for this. Again, for the same reasons, right? You have these, uh, number three, legal and cultural changes. So I'll, I'll point to a couple of things. We all know that gambling, sports gambling, sports betting is now going to be legal state by state across uh, the nation. 
And in addition, recently, very recently, there was a ruling by the NC2A that college athletes could not be prevented from making money on their names and likenesses. So that's going to be a huge piece of fuel. This is a influencer economy. It's about the live streaming. It's about the interactivity. So I, I personally predict that the NC2A ruling will have a very big impact. You then also have, like I mentioned, the rise and importance of social media interactivity and chat. I'm going to share a demo. I call it IRL chat. And what I want to just say here is emojis are something that we have laughed about for many years, right? And I used to make jokes about, hey, we're, we're losing language. We're going to go back to the, 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 the time of hier hieroglyphics, which I've never been able to pronounce very well. And the truth is, like, that's happening in real time. Like, even my Outlook app now, not only emojis, but GIFs, right? And so there's just a tremendous uptick, I think, in this whole idea of incorporating these things into our visual language. I'm not making a value judgment on that, by the way, um, whether it's good or bad. But I will say that Slack has been a, a, a force there, bringing more emojis in. And to the point I'm trying to make, there was literally a Wall Street Journal article last month that essentially said, you know what, in the office, it's okay to use emojis here and there you know, along these rules, right? So the idea is like we're becoming, uh, adding more visual language into our communications. I do think that's an important part of this. We have globalization, so more screens and more content in many more places. So if you're distributing content globally and you want to have different languages on that screen, that's one of the major trends, I would say. Number six, I'm going to talk about this more specifically, but there's a game called Kahoot. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but... Um, I'm going to go through this in the demo, so I won't spend a lot of time on it right now. But a lot of folks know that the app is everything. And a lot of major companies going after major businesses, the app is everything. And so for all these years, essentially, mobile web browsing has been forgotten. And it's really a pretty bad experience for the most part. There is a company called Kahoot, another company called Crowdpur that's also on my list, another company called Quizlet. What are these companies doing? Well, they're starting at the educational level. So on back to school night was when I discovered Kahoot. And a teacher in the class asked everybody to pick up their phone. So I'm going to do this in a bit, so you don't have to do this right now. But the point is, if you try to get people to download an app in a game, let's say, at a venue, you'll fail. Like, nobody wants to do that. never quite works, right? But if you can give them a dead simple, clean web page, no registration required, maybe they would log on to that tool and the success of Kahoot and Quizlet and this new category of interactive tool kind of was some of the inspiration for me of like, well, maybe there is something else here in this kind of two-screen environment as long as we don't put up all these barriers to people in using the platform, right? So we've all seen these um, patterns come and go, but when they don't work quite right, I always remember in the interactive TV days, um, Dish very early on was heavy in the interactive TV games, and I remember being bullish on it, and it was very exciting. We were in Colorado, a big summit, and Charlie Ergen came to the stage for about 10 minutes. He's going to give a good presentation. Very dynamic, charismatic guy. But I just remember one thing, which was basically told the entire room that we were all going to fail until the loading time for the app would be less than 15 seconds, right? So it was right now, it was like at that time, it was like you press a button and then you sit and wait, right? So if stuff doesn't work, then you can't really tell whether there will be uptick in the, in the use cases or not. Then we have cloud. I just put that word there in the beginning and then the, the ellipsis, just because I think you guys all know, right? It's on demand, it's global, new ways of configuring where resources are and how they're used. And then finally, open source, which kind of you know, is fueling a tremendous amount of innovation in every direction. And I would say even here, you literally have, because of Twitch and the Twitch streamers and OBS, you have companies selling OBS on GPU clouds, right? So, these are very disruptive trends that I think are going to bring in 2020 a, a renewed interest in some of the activity we're talking about here today. So this is some, some of the work that I do for vendors. This was actually done for a vendor, um, but I've taken off their name in order to be a neutral analyst for this particular presentation. I have no affiliation with any of the vendors that I'm talking about here, with one exception, which is the tool I'm going to show you guys in a little bit is actually built on top of one of these cloud graphic platforms. 
I'll talk more about that. But this is just the data. And the first thing that I like to do with these surveys, there's a lot of surveys that talk about, you know, ask all these generic questions, and I love those. This is what I like to do. I like to dive pretty deep and figure out if I can have a sort of cocktail, get some data from online consumer surveys. These are census representative surveys. I've been doing surveys for many years. It's an art and a science, and I'm very disciplined about it. And the thing that I always like to do is figure out if I went into a cocktail party, like how many people here have done this, right? So this is what I try to do with my surveys. How many people have watched live streams on a social platform, right? I just want to get a basic sense of how many people are doing this behavior. And I think what you see here is, you know, you got 20, I generally say if it's interactivity, it's somewhere between 20 and 25. Uh, this, this live streaming thing obviously moved over time. When, when I did some of these surveys around Facebook Live's uh, initial launch, more people obviously have heard about it and tried it, right? But I think we're talking about a third of the, of the population. So you walk out into a cocktail party and every third person would say to you, yeah, oh yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. It's that, you know, when you, that, that, that uh, writer that I follow who gets on Twitter and Periscope for 10 or 15 minutes. I think it's a pretty significant number. It's rising over time. This was a little bit of the surprise in this survey was I expected video games and esports to be at the top and actually movie and TV series are, are at the top, right? So if you think about shows like Walking Dead and Talking Dead, all, uh, th these are shows that are incredibly social, have incredible communities, and there's a lot of content uh, online uh, about those that are using live streams, which is, again, part of the, um, part of the driver. So now, uh, this is kind of an important slide. So everybody has a different opinion about how many graphics should show up on the screen, right? Oh, it should be clean. You should take them all off, right? My, I, I made a post, uh, joke in my post, that my wife doesn't like the tickers. I love the tickers. Like, I want to see more information on the screen, right? So this is kind of a perfect example to me of a use case for cloud graphics that will, that is happening, I'll show you, share some use cases like Clippers Court Vision. How many people have heard of Clippers Court Vision? So it's basically the idea there is that I can watch the game and I can customize the feed coming to me. Truly personalized. This isn't personalized sports like algorithms that decide what clip I want to watch next. It's literally I want to see on top of these players as they're moving around the court what the probability is that they can make a shot from that place on the court, right? Or I'm a other language user, I'm a, Hispa you know, I'm a Hispanic user, and I want to see some of the Chiron graphics and stats in Spanish, right? So there are lots of reasons that uh, graphics obviously add tremendous value production to all these live streams. The other thing they do is they allow you to personalize. So now let's dive into some of the use cases and just time check for myself here. Uh, any questions, by the way? I'm going to open up for questions at the end, but if you have questions, go ahead and ask. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. I'm sorry. Uh, actually, oh. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So we talked a little bit about Twitch already. Um, and so I would say a few different things about this. Number one, chat activity. You've talked about people that are, talk to people that are in esports. They love the immediate feedback, right? It's actually part of what people like about this, is that somebody will put something out, a streamer will say something. It's in a very authentic, real-time uh, experience. And so getting those chat messages into the stream is something that if you're a top streamer paid by Monster Sports to play video games all day, this is the kind of thing you love to do. You also have the idea of digital goods. I'm not sure exactly the, the sort of prevalence. It's another one that I like to do a test on, like how many people are actually paying, right? Because this is what Twitch asks you to do. If you want to give a thumbs up to this performer and you want that thumbs up to be like a custom fun, thumbs up, you're going to pay like 99 cents for that, right? So that's an interesting use case that is happening. I don't know how widely. We talked a little bit about this already in terms of uh, personalized sportscasts. There's an investment bank on Wall Street calling this multicast, the idea of there's multiple feeds going on at once. It could be a betting feed. There's multiple languages. Uh, you might have streams geared towards younger audiences, right? So um, Katie Nolan is an ESPN Plus. Actually, I think she may have moved, but they, they, um, the NFL did a broadcast, and basically Katie Nolan and her crew was announcing it on a, on a digital channel. It was actually more interesting and engaging for me, and not a millennial, but... Um, than the, than the broadcast. It was quite well done. 
This is Clipper's court vision, so, and it's just an example of, I, I tried to clarify this, it wasn't this big on the screen, but it's just a little fun emoji that they put up when uh, there was a steal in this case, right? So there's a thief. And then you've got, in the other screen on the right-hand corner, uh, your kind of classic strike zone. Use case three is betting, and I'm, I'm, there is some predict the play here, but I'm, I'm counting that as use case four. So here's some betting uh, concepts up in terms of the daily wager, VSIN. We all know that betting's gonna be legalized, and in the sports business, it'll have multiple impacts. You're gonna have more advertisers because there are these sites that are taking bets, booking sites. You're going to keep people engaged longer in games that are uh, not close or not exciting, right, because you wanna see if they covered. And then, um, and, and then in addition to that, you have this sort of an ex uh, auxiliary content, if you will, about the betting odds and so forth that you might want to see on the screen or uh, basically incorporate into your conversation post-game. So this is an example. It's actually a, a theoretical that I saw a screenshot um, from one, one of these products that was like the ideal betting man's sports feed. That's kind of fun. I'm not a betting man, but I guess if I were, that's the feed I'd want. And then, of course, the predictive play or prop bets, gamification. This one's also super hot. I'm not sure how this turns out, but I do know, because I've been in this business long enough, that for at least 12 or 18 months, there's gonna be a lot of money spent on this. And you can go to the App Store right now, and literally every day, you know, I, I, a new app comes up, a new app pops up that's this experience. This is probably, I just have like the two pictures here, and you know, it's a real simple concept, right? But like, I do watch Periscope once in a while, partly to see what's going on, and partly because it get, sometimes it's compelling, and it gets more compelling over time. There's more and more apps kind of mixing the video and editorializing it, curating it, et cetera. And I've seen these, as Scott Adams in particular, say to his audience, like, how many think this? How many of you think this? And then you can see the, the streamer actually watching the text feeds coming up, right? So it's a perfect example for the, you know, hey, quick polling question like I did here. Raise your hand. Tell me if you think, you know, tell me, tell me if you think about this or that. And, and many of the most interesting use cases and case studies we'll talk about later are the ones where, where the broadcasters and the creators in the show are trying to have the audience data change, potentially change the outcome of the match or of the show. Right, so why did you pick this, that, or the other, and have that chat uh, message show up, not just on end users' devices, but in the studio, and having people sort of mull that over in real time. So that's another good use case. Cloud Playout is just beginning, right? Everybody's putting their VOD assets into a virtual linear channel, and so there's a really great set of use cases. This is an example of a company called Amagi, or Amagi, Am I think Amagi is it's pronounced, and essentially they're doing this, and they have some cloud graphics um, uh, integration. So for example, you could bring After Effects into it. So if you're running a live linear feed with old content, this is a really simple way to update or freshen that content with, for example, social data. Um, and it's also really important when you talk about doing live linear, we're like moving from, you know, linear is dead, now back to, oh, we have VOD assets, like let's put them into a linear feed, right? It turns out if you end up watching a TV and there's something on, like there is actually inertia. Even myself, I found myself like watching, you know, action sports just because it was the first channel that popped up on the Samsung Plus channel, right? So I think the potential for these live linear channels is very high, and I think cloud graphics will undoubtedly be a part of that. And then uh, this is just a really quick, I didn't really cover a lot of the advertising creative piece of this, but you can, of course, change all of the creative or important parts of a creative ad by changing the message, right, and burning new dynamic data. Hey, Brian, in this location or whatever, and this company, one of, the, one of these companies is, is advocating for A-B testing of such data, so that's another great use case of cloud graphics. And then, finally, I wanna talk about two quick things here. One on the left-hand side, you may have seen these happy or not boxes, right? So there's, a, there's sort of a renewed sense of like, well, maybe there's different ways to do feedback, and with cloud graphics, you can do that use case with a mobile phone and a cloud graphics system without the uh, physical hardware, which is great. And then finally, entertainment or restaurants or digital signage. So I had the pleasure yesterday to be at LA Live for some meetings, and I walked into a Tom's um, watch bar. They have like 190 screens, and on one of those screens, literally as you walk in, it says like 
chat to this screen, right? Post your photo to this screen. And it's just like being at a game. So if I go to Instagram and put my photo up, there, it's gonna show up on the screen. I had an opportunity to talk to the manager of this restaurant, which has multiple locations and multiple venues. I think it's like the owner, he had like a Vegas Knights jacket on, so I think it's like, you know, the owner of the, the Vegas Knights or one of the arenas. And the bottom line is, he was very bullish on this. He, they had both pub trivia, the, the, the hashtagging of pictures, and so I took also from this Activate report, apparently sports bars are in a bit of trouble. People are, are watching live sports in, outside the home uh, at, a, at a lesser rate these days. And then finally, I wanna make one quick final point is that um, a lot of this too has to do with on-device interactivity. So that too can be considered cloud graphics. It's data coming from the cloud and then being rendered on the device. But I think that the control of that data uh, and the, and the uh, creation of the assets that would be sent to that device are happening in the cloud in some cases. And so from that perspective, I put that into, uh, into this conversation here. And I wanna say one more thing, which is that, we'll talk about this later, but one thing that's true, and one of the contributors to this deck said this to me, and I think all of us know this. If you have end-to-end -end control of a live video ecosystem, you can do a lot of really great and creative stuff. But who has, lot, who has that control? Who has end-to-end -end control like that? It's Facebook, it's Twitch, it's Mixer, et cetera. So not all of us have that. And his great quote was like, if you don't have control, your only recourse is to burn things into the stream. So I wanna point out here, this is Twitch. This is Twitch NFL, right? And they have a player, so they do control the, the device and the on-device uh, graphic overlay here. But what I found curious is like it's still not coordinated with the broadcast graphics, right? So it's conflicting a bit here with the graphics. And so you begin to sort of think about what it would mean to have a unified approach, where if you're not an interactive device, you're given some uh, graphics that say maybe, well, if you want to be interactive, go here, or you assume that they're not being interactive versus the experience on the device, which is going to be more directly interactive. But they should be seamless in any event. And so I think this is the type of thing that sh just showcases exactly where we're at, like the Twitch ecosystem, the graphics on the screen inside the player, and then the broadcast ecosystem, having it in, in the feed, and those conflicting. A company called Vidpresso, there's a gentleman that used to work at Vidpresso who contributed also, and they really do, I, I think they represent one of the pure plays early on in this space. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they were acquired by Facebook, and I think what they felt was that there was too much kind of one-off activity in this cloud graphics space, which is true. That's why I'm here, right? There's a lot of one-off projects. It's very much based on you know, local Channel 5 weather person who saw this and said, yes, let's do it, and I know how to read, right? It takes, Kel you know, there's another use case with Kelly and uh, Ryan Seacrest, Amazon Prime, right? It takes Ryan Seacrest, to say on air to millions of people, go to ryanandkellynow.com and vote, right? So that type of read and active uh, participation in these programs from a creative individual is, I think, ultimately one of the big um, obstacles, right, to this being a sort of widespread phenomenon that we all know, and we, we know what to do when we walk into a venue, we know how to interact with a TV show, right, it's still at that stage, I think, where it requires a lot of creativity, and that has been part of the problem, and what these guys felt is, like, if we could create video and make it more like HTML, it would just make it so much easier, and we could spread this type of behavior much further, and of course, they're believers in this space. This is also something I wanna to just touch on briefly. There's just so many different conversations and topics here, right? And, and so I realize it's, it's, it's quite a lot of information, but I do wanna say it's related. So Google announced last year, launched Stadia. You guys familiar with that? It's the cloud gaming platform, right? And Stadia actually is rendering stuff and then sending it to a device. And actually, that's what Active Video is a company also that was, had, had started doing this in like the 80s, right? So there have been multiple attempts over time to do stuff in the cloud and send it down to the device. And so it's not an entirely unrelated phenomenon. There's a company also in the ecosystem map whose, whose vision is for, that there is a, an encoder for every viewer. Right? And if you have an encoder for every viewer, that's quite an expensive stream, but it's also how that mission impossible interface works, right? Where you get in and you're moving screens around. And so it's, it's very cool stuff. And I think like everything in video tech, we're all, you know, I'm thinking about this as like, oh, it's, it's coming, right? And it's just a matter of the timing and whether it hits. 
So that's kind of an interesting trend to watch. Okay, good. So now I want to talk really briefly about this uh, IRL chat demo, and you're all going to be my guinea pigs. And I, and I hope what, what I'm hoping to do with this is really to show what this is all about. So this will be a slight digression. If you all could do me a favor, or not all of you, but if some of you want to play along, you should now open your phone, your mobile device, and, okay, actually, so, um, Everybody open their mobile device. You're going to go to a mobile web browser. You're just going to go to a browser, and you're going to go to IRLchat.tv. You can get it in two ways. You can type the full URL, IRLchat.tv slash ring, or you can go to IRLchat.tv, and then type the code ring. And when you get there, you're going to see a bunch of things. It's a prototype. It's meant to show off things. So it's not the, the, the easiest or simplest interface when you get there, but scroll down to the poll. And do me a favor, and when you get there, start, you know, submit an answer to the poll so I can see that it's working. Okay, good. So we've got some people for whom it's working. Is there anybody in the audience for whom this is not working right now? Pretty cool. Right? Everybody getting the idea? So this platform, what I'm doing is I'm taking your votes, and I'm calling an API to this cloud graphics platform called Singular. That's all I'm doing, right? And then some of you discovered some of the other, oh, now I've got some real, now I've got some real playing happening, right? So these are all emojis and GIFs. On the bottom, you'll see I'm pulling in Twitter feeds here. And if you want, you can actually text me a message. You can change the color of that message and the font of that message. And I would invite any of you to send me a rude message because I've also incorporated AI moderated chat. And so you'll probably get, okay, so, 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 and then let's see, this enjoy the talk seems to have given this a little bit of trouble. So let me just fix that. Sometimes it has to be reset. Okay. Did anybody try to get something through on the uh, chat and it didn't work? Oh, somebody must have reset. <laughs> okay. I realize this is a little bit dangerous. Right. So, some, so okay. Now, thank you, God. I appreciate that you're all having fun with it. Everyone having fun with this? Yes. Okay, cool. So, but actually, there's something really cool here, too, um, and some of you have discovered it, I guess, which is that if you go below, the demo only below this point, so here's what's really fun, and keep your phones out because we're about to play a fun game, is that I can basically control the graphics right here. Right, and I'm giving you all control, so we're all conflicting, and you're, some of you are messing with me now. Um, but yes, right? So that's pretty cool. I can make these things disappear and reappear. And then let's just do this really quickly. You guys can pick wh whichever one you want, and let's just do a quick game. We're going to see, obviously, the first one to, to get to 10 is going to win. And hopefully that, okay, okay, right, right. Demo is fucked. That should that should not have gone through. I'm gonna have to get right to Azure Cloud Services on that. So it's not perfect because I have done nothing. I've just incorporated Azure Cloud Services, and I have in my interface a way to essentially create different levels of tolerance of that. Okay. All right. How about a little hand of applause for the demo? Fun stuff. And so let me just say this, because this is the pitch, right? So you're talking about a creative idea. You're talking about a creative show, Colin Cowherd, right? You're talking about producers. And so a lot of companies do provide a lot of templated ideas. One thing that I thought was sort of interesting is, I bet Colin Cowherd has a specific idea, right? A specific kind of game. And could you create a templated scenario where you create this game, it could be this one, it could be horse racing, there's all kinds of like gamification models here. And essentially, <laughs> I wonder if I even have, I, I may have, <laughs> this is it. So let's, 
Yeah, no, that's, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go and see, just so you guys can see in real time what's going on, okay? So, uh, first of all, let me make sure. So I do have chat moderation on, and I do have these set. So probably what's happening is not every one of these events is, I, I, I've had basically, just show you guys what's going on back end here, right? So I'm actually taking these scores, I'm gonna go to the end and see Fucking demo. This one seems to have been rejected. This one should have been rejected. What the dollar sign? Yes? Did that get rejected? Whoever put that, what the SHIT with the money? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay, good. Anyways, it's not at scale just yet. And Azure allows you, though, to put definitions and words and things like that. And I'll say this, two things. Number one, for many years now we've been, oh, Facebook, it's so hard to moderate content. Twitter, it's so hard to moderate, right? And I think a lot of people's reaction is like, really? And I, I think it's tricky. I don't mean to like, you know, get into some constitutional debate here, but I really have a hard time with that. It's not that hard to do, in my view. And a lot of people will talk about how, how you can do it. And what I would say is Twitch actually has a really robust platform, and if, if Twitch ever decides to open up APIs, which I strongly believe they will do, their chat moderation, which has been trained, right? We all know how AI and ML, it's basically it's a very tedious, dumb process requiring tremendous amounts of training and training data sets. And so I think that this um, automated chat moderation function is, is really an important piece to the whole puzzle. All right, um, any questions right now? No. So again, to uh, back to the presentation really quickly, is this is an example of uh, a text, an SMS text poll, and it's, an, it, it's easier than downloading an app, but I don't think it's as low friction as the mobile web app. And then again, at a game, I can actually sponsor a message. I have to pay you know, 150 bucks, and I call up the, um, the, the, the team ahead of time, and I write the check. It does feel like a nice Uber type of use case for two bucks or five bucks, 10 bucks, whatever, to send a little message to my wife or to have some fun emojis on the screen. Or instead of the game where we all just shout out the answer, we can all just actually enter answers in. And so I think we're gonna see a lot more of these use cases. So now um, put this back in presentation mode, check the time. And so this is what I have built just spend uh, two seconds on it here. So it can take pretty much any one of these feeds in, and that includes these specialized stats and sports feeds. It puts it through, there's basically a mean stack web app, just a very lightweight web app that you can spin up on AWS. LightSail, which is another simple way to do things. This Singular Live is this company, it's one of the companies in the deck that offers you a platform to author some graphics and then control the APIs of when those graphics come into the screen and when they go off the screen. And then I'm using OBS to actually send some of this stuff to YouTube and Twitch. In this case, um, you, you know, you're, you're basically, so, sorry, this is a really important part of the conversation. Let me just say this. If anyone's watching this in the future, my hope and my expectation is that the major public clouds, one of the major public clouds, and I, I, I think that they're investigating and exploring this right now, should be able to open an API that essentially embeds Chromium into their encoding services. So if that happens, you guys watch out for that headline. If they embed Chromium embedded uh, framework into their encoding services, that means that you can take an HTML page and drop it into that API and have it rendered out into video. Super simple. I did the same thing with OBS. I did OBS on my Mac at home, it worked great. I also spun up a virtual private server on Amazon, launched an OBS on that, worked great. So for 100 bucks a month approximately, you can have a world-class production studio in the cloud. I hate to say that in this industry where I'm, we're all trying to make a healthy living, but it's incredibly disruptive in my mind. And then you can add on to it this IRL chat mobile uh, interactivity, send that out to ribbon boards, social networks, et cetera. Okay? Okay, let's show the big map that hopefully will go viral. All of you will share it, and this is the 
reason that you will want to come to this presentation and share it afterwards. So what I've tried to do here is map the landscape best I could, and you see a lot of interesting, <clears throat> a lot of interesting things. Up in the left-hand corner, it starts with these kind of social media walls. You have uh, in that live audience, I mentioned that company Kahoot, that I think is really driving its own uh, perspective into it, and a company called CrowdPur that participated, doing really interesting stuff in making games happen in real life events. You have HQ, HQ Trivia, which I have as sort of a major trend and impactor from the upper right hand side, where you have multiple people talking and chatting in live real time, and then that becoming the stream. Uh, and, then, and then over on the left, heading down, you have what I say there is entertainment or uh, closed circuit TV, digital out of home, right? So a company called Chive TV or Gas Station TV, um, a company called Upshow or Telemetry TV. So these are all sort of different ways of getting at some of the same things, and that's what we see in these disruptive areas, a lot of convergence of completely different use cases, right? So a company like Telemetry TV does some things that are very similar, I would say, to some of, the, some of these cloud graphics stuff, but they're focused only on digital signage and so their, their business model is quite different. And again, it becomes quite disruptive. You still get a HTML page out of telemetry TV and encode that into your video. You then have the broadcast graphics piece, um, which again, I just had there in there as a reference. I do want to make a quick shout out to superfly.tv and, and, and the Casper CG server, which is an open source graphics server that's uh, been out there for many years doing very capable stuff. And again, not uh, it's, it's open source, so it's free. Um, and then over to the right, right, we see on this side is this company, Stream Elements. Here's your Twitch trend pushing this way. You have a couple of video players that, video player tech firms, right? So Wirewax and Happy Act you may have heard of, others. Prometheon does a lot of this. Singular is capable of doing this where you're actually feeding uh, data feeds and interactive feeds to the device. You've got down here, this traditional, I put the traditional online video universe in the lower right-hand corner. Encoding.com has actually been at this for quite some time, and Vimeo has released a product recently that involves live graphics. But many times, companies will say they have a graphics integration, and it's just placing a PNG into the, into the frame. And, and that's just, I think, probably not enough, right? You can watermark or whatever, but channel branding. But that's really, I think, the very basics. And then moving back this way, um, so in, some of these companies also contributed. Here's this screens company called Unpause. It's doing what they call live mixing in the cloud. And then you see a lot of the like usual suspects over here, right? From the, the Grabios of the world, all of these software tools where you can actually take an HTML straight into the tool, or you can buy like a blue titler effect, et cetera. Okay. Um, I think what I'm going to do, so all of this, uh, all of the rest of this, well, the whole thing is going to be available, like I say, on this URL. It's not there yet, but it will be, so I would encourage you to download it. And I have a couple more minutes, but I don't want to take up too much time, so I'll, I'll just go through a few of these. This is uh, a gentleman that I mentioned was from Vidpresso, a a happens to work at Facebook. Facebook, I think, is, is definitely with the watch uh, product trying to figure out more ways to engage technology vendors in this space. A company called Never Know has launched a new product called Beyond. I like this one because Never Know's been around for a long time, doing interactivity for a long time, and has sort of decided that a new product was needed in this domain, which shows that a company that's been around for a long time is still in the game, right? This is uh, some of their this is, these, I, asked them, I asked everybody to participate by sending a couple of screenshots for case studies. So this was one of theirs, and it's basically Coors Light in the UK. And it's a tweet your vote, right? You also have the Eurovision Song Contest. Ex Machina is another company in this domain. Here's Amazon Prime Day. They're selling video games, and you can see it really fits. It's sort of endemic, right? So you've got the chat going on, and they're discussing Amazon Prime Day in the upper left-hand corner of the feed. Also, a shopping showcase, CEO from CrowdPur, which again, started as a live event platform. Then he just noticed that people were taking the URL and plugging it into their OBS. Started getting involved in custom workflows, basically, with broadcasters where you could create a, an HQ trivia type of experience and have it encoded in the OBS uh, suite. And he actually had some really 
cool things when I talked about future vision, right? So he's talking about turn-based live games, competitions that are queuing players, visualizing thousands of participants in an interactive experience. He's got a big vision for the kinds of interactivity. This is a company called Prometheon. They are focused a little more, I would say, on the advertising side, serving interactive ads and, and what they call augmented advertising. And you can see some of that's on device and some of it's second screen. Uh, their key uh, core elements of value, measurable, contextual, relevant, right? All the keywords we want. Flowex, another startup out of Spain. There's been a few of these actually in, the, in, in Spain, out of Barcelona, I believe, building new experiences, multi-platform interactive experiences. This was a great screenshot, right? So they're on Facebook Watch, they're being used by, um, in this case it was, I can't remember, Copa Libertadores, Libertadores, my Spanish needs brushing up, but um, 11.5 million live viewers, right? It's a pretty, pretty good number. More case studies from them. Ari Evans is actually here at the show. I would encourage you guys to work, uh, reach out to him. For sure in the eSports space, he's been pretty tightly focused on that, and he's got pretty much every major eSports uh, player uh, involved or in, in projects of one sort or another. And he's got an interesting view, I think, too, of the idea that, well, he's got pr predictive gaming, the Rocket League is a big case, obviously. And then the quote here at the, at the bottom, one of the things that he talks about quite a bit is how many different devices he's been able to create this experience on. So the fact is, this is a kind of a creative process. To, where do we put the graphics? How do we get the, the, the character on screen to mention them? And so uh, the, their, their point of pride is the fact that they have this framework that works really well across all kinds of different use cases in eSports. Stream elements, um, you know, again, Completely different company. It was just sort of like, who are you and why are you, you know, what's streaming Media West? And what? So you, you, you find these really interesting disconnects that to me are just confirmation of, oh, that's why th this group over here doesn't know about it and this group over here knows about this other thing. And as these collide, I think it becomes a really interesting place to look for what's going to be next in TV. So when you get non endemic, so it, the quote at the bottom here, you can't read it, but like they've got this endemic marketplace of influencers. But what, what they're doing at Stream Elements is specifically going out to the non-endemics, the you know, Coca-Colas or whatever it might be, and, and really teaching them, like, look, we'll do an interactive you know, uh, uh, chatbot. We've got polls, branded alerts, but also like, we'll create a chatbot for you, a Twitch chatbot that sits in the, in, in the context of these other companies. And so I've got some screenshots from the Stream Elements platform. Singular, I've talked about a little bit, and I've shown you one, I, one of what I believe is one of the key use cases of Singular, the fact that their API on the back end is very robust. So no matter what you create in their platform, you can then create a simple app to ping it and update that data in real time. And they, did, they, they just did this case study, this Ineos 159 challenge. I forget exactly the details and the names, but this is like the fastest anybody has, has run, I guess, a marathon or something like that, right? Or no, I guess 10K, yeah, sorry. MBA, um, iPowWow is a company that's been doing this for many years, uh, CNN, and also the Oscars was done just this past year. Um, so that's another example where it's like, you talk to people about this, and you might think that it had kind of come and gone or fizzled out, and then you know, you, this year at the Oscars, like, oh, interactive game, you know, there, there's still, Producers, executives at all these digital media companies are still trying to figure out that holy grail of how do we retain audience and retain engagement. This is the, that quote I referred to earlier. It's too long, so I won't read it. But like sometimes your only recourse is to burn video into the stream. And so that's where Cloud Graph, one of the places that Cloud Graphics really does shine. I talked about Jonas Hummelstrand, creator, not just of the Superfly company, but of the Casper CG product, which is a really a disruptive open source uh, graphics server. And then I, I mentioned a little bit this company, the one encoding, per, one encoder per person screens. And they are looking for, so this is kind of a, a cool screenshot here, and I'll just show you, so it's hard to explain, but like, so here's Xbox Live or Xbox Interface. 
Here's a Roku video interface. This is your Xfinity video interface. So three video interfaces, and what this person's doing is resizing and moving them on the screen, and they're basically showing up here, instantly encoded and, and sent via one stream to the uh, device on-prem, on right? So in, you're not, you think about a mixed channel, custom mixed channel, right? Instead of, like a DirecTV mixed channels, they decide the eight channels, they send one stream down, and that's how that works. Custom mixed channel, the reason it doesn't exist yet is because it would take one encoder per person. So that's one of the use cases that these guys are going after, pretty nifty. And it's a little more, I would say, of an encoding play, this one, right? So it's about these uh, FF, uh, FPGA uh, instances on Amazon, et cetera. And then Wowza has uh, participated, gave me this content. Um, I believe it's not confirmed, so I'm a little nervous to say, but I believe that Clearcaster has in, in integrated Chromium embedded framework in their, in their box. And I, I believe that to be one of the first appliances that has embedded Chromium embedded framework. I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this. But again, my point here is to try to encourage all vendors of encoding appliances to be able to integrate Chromium embedded framework inside their appliances. It would just open up a tremendous amount of innovation in the workflows for broadcasters, uh, pay TV providers, et cetera. And then finally, Megaphone TV, which I think summed it up really nicely as like polls, trivia, social, and advertising. And they also have, I think, one of the most interesting use cases from a live TV perspective. I did much research over the years. You saw my, my initial uh, surveys on social TV, which is when you're watching TV, are you ever interacting with the TV, right? So you either on Twitter or at, or in response to the TV content. It's a vote type of, uh, type of use case. And every time I did this survey, Walking Dead was like the, one of the biggest names that came up. This is what people, you know, they all, you know, Walking Dead viewers were much more likely to have engaged in this kind of social TV. And so, of course, um, you know, a AMC then launched this entire show, which is called Talking Dead. And it's basically a talk show about Walking Dead, right? So it's just more of that community engagement and community chat. And then they run polls and predictive gaming, et cetera. And then uh, finally, I love this one because I thought the fan engagement use case was a great one. I think there are barriers to it. I think it'll happen, but it's a little bit, we're, we're still working out how that happens and how much you know, money it's worth. It's, it's not every day, and there's all kinds of reasons why I think it's not a real business just yet. But, um, and so I love the fact that he had a case when I called him up. I was like, yeah, we did the NFL you know, Baltimore Ravens recently where they have a, a, a trivia question up on the, on the board. And then the final one from Megaphone, I mentioned this earlier, which was really impressive to see Ryan Seacrest talk about driving people to a vote. And it was a great vote, right? I'll just end with this kind of cute thing. I, by the way, I love box teams. I did one of these when I was a kid. I was R2-D2. And then like my candy holes were like here. But then people would put the candy here and it would go, fall into the ground. Just fun stories. So this is uh, a whack-a-mole, just <laughs> this little kid these different whack-a-moles, and then here's this Christina with, uh, as a bookworm, right? So to me, those are the kinds of use cases that showcase what cloud graphics can do, and also kind of showcase a little bit of like, yeah, it takes a creative producer to come in and be like, oh, how do we orchestrate this? How can we make this a programming element? And that's, that's I think, what has prevented this from being a little bit more widely um, distributed and, and used, so that's all. That's the cloud graphics session. Do, do I, I have any questions? Or do we all want to go back and play more games? Okay. <laughs> Everybody good? Any other questions? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I, I think that um, it's, it's, I don't have a simple answer, right? I mean, you have to, and this is, I think, the big task, is get your entree into that creative uh, person, right? And then, you know, watch the show and come up with the concepts and pitch it that way. I don't think there's an easy way to do it. And I will say, 
my, I don't know where this goes. Like I saw these trends, I'm like, oh, why, why isn't this a category? Why don't we talk about this more, more broadly? And I, I'm currently trying to figure out how to get that type of a discussion into a more scalable mode, right? Like, can I go and sit down with some of these ESPN guys and say, instead of having like 15 vendors all like chopping at you in different ways, like, can we do some sort of a structured process where you tell me the shows, and give me some notes, and I'll go collect, you know, five or six proposals from these different companies that are gonna have creative proposals. I mean, I hate to do that in the sense it's like, an, it's like a bake-off for an ad agency, right? Where you're now all contributing creative ideas, and that's like a weird, I, I don't like the idea of giving my creative ideas, but I also kind of looking at it from their perspective of like, yeah, how do we create a more fluid, liquid conversation where when, you know, because let me tell you, I do have a lot of these conversations, and it is not a liquid conversation, right? It's, this guy's looking at this thing, why, I don't know, they did it last year, and this, right? It's, it's very haphazard, and I would like to see a more formal sort of focused funnel for how do we develop these things in a more scalable fashion. That's a really, t basically, I don't have an answer for you, but I'm here to try to help and, and see how we, we can make that happen. I do know I used to pitch and sell creative elements like this when I was in, um, you know, in home video, interactive DVD. We did, you know, Harry Potter and Shrek, and, and I, I know, because I was deeply involved in this, the proposal process itself was a process. Like, I used a lot of creative energy often with gathered people in the room and what are the questions we want to ask and we tighten it up and package it up and then make the presentation where it's like a creative presentation that's related to the show, to the show content. That's not terribly scalable, right? So if I can figure out, if we can all figure out as a community how to kind of create a pipeline that makes it easier for them to decide, makes it easier for the vendors, that would be my, that would be my goal. Make, make my small dent in the universe. Yeah, go ahead. Right, which means everybody needs to have in their head, like, what's the interactive portion of the show, right? So, which is why, let's see, put this deck up for you guys. I also plan, like, I have my little IRL chat thing. I've been doing some pitching and things like that. But I, I literally have this issue, and I literally have stepped back and say, look, is any, like, are all of these, you know, you look at all these case studies, and you step back, and it's like, oh, there's something here, right? And then is there a commitment to the show to do something? And then what would be the right vendor Right? Who how would be the right approach? So I'm trying to myself step back a bit and figure this out. How do you get people in the mindset first of like, do we want to do any interactivity? And if so, what does that look like? And, uh, and then which vendor, how to do it, et cetera, might, might come after that. But again, I think it's a great question. I think it's a great answer. And yeah, I don't think there's.
That's right. And I would say one interesting thing, I was on another panel that was doing user research for YouTube TV, and the gal was telling a story of like, oh, the commercials would come off and these six millennials on the couch all jump on their phone, right? And I was thinking to myself, oh, number one, if that's an ad, that's great, you're interacting. But number two, you're just now, we're now all confirming no one's watching the ads, right? So I think it's a delicate balance, you know? If they're, not, if they're, not, if they're on their phone not looking at ads, no TV network's gonna be super happy about it. So you gotta turn it upside down and say, hey, let's do an interactive ad and see if we can get people engaged in, in that kind of conversation. I think they're, they're difficult conversations. I, I, I am seeing a case and a, and, and a gap for some platform-esque type of play to help everybody learn how, the, you know, how do we do this successfully every time? How do we repeat it? How do we scale it? I think that's something that's not yet solved. So, alrighty. Thank you guys, I really appreciate you showing up and enjoy the rest of the day at Streaming Media and I'll be around if you have any other questions, happy to chat further. Thank you.